We continue today with our sermon series going through the book of Ephesians entitled Developing Unity in the Church. So take your Bible, open up to the book of Ephesians. We'll be in Ephesians chapter 5 today. Also inside of your bulletin, you'll find there some sermon notes. You can pull those out and follow along as well with the sermon. We've memorized one uh, memory verse from Ephesians, and I'm asking you to do a second one, Ephesians 4. 32. So let's take a look at that, Ephesians 4.32. We'll say the verse together and then the reference as well. Say it with me. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Ephesians 4.32. Now you see that one has a little rhyme to it. Did you figure that out? So you can remember it a little bit easier. These are this particular verse, Ephesians 4.32, we looked at last week. And you remember that these Christ-like characteristics of kindness and compassion and forgiving, they help us in the process of guarding and keeping and developing unity in the church. So memorize that verse as we go through this scripture. Today we come to part seven, which is how to imitate God. Now, many of you have been around on newborn babies before at some time in your life. Either you've had some babies in your house or you've been around other babies. And you may have noticed that the little babies have a unique ability. They have the ability to imitate any sound that they want to. They have the ability to speak, as a newborn baby, the ability to hear and to speak any language that they want to. Babies are born with great hearing ability. And they can hear the different sounds and nuances of any language. They're also born with very pliable vocal cords, flexible and pliable vocal cords, which they can then mimic or imitate any language that they want to. But eventually, they get to the point where they hear and imitate only the language of their parents that they hear the most often. But as little babies, you know, they begin babbling and cooing when they're little. And sometimes their babbling sounds like English. Sometimes it sounds like Spanish. Sometimes it sounds like German or French. And they can switch from day to day. And you may have noticed that before. And that's because they have that ability to learn, develop, and speak any language that they're listening to. But eventually, their vocal cords begin to get less pliable. Their hearing becomes less sensitive. And they imitate the language only that they hear the most, which is whatever their parents are speaking. As adults, of course, our hearing... <laughs> our hearing disappears a little bit. Our vocal cords are no longer pliable at all. And so we're stuck with whatever language we learned first. And it becomes more difficult for us to learn a second language as an adult. Because we don't hear the little nuances as much in other languages. And we're not able to mimic other languages as, as well as we could as a child. But it's a very narrow window that children and babies have to learn any language before the vocal cords in the hearing become less pliable and less <clears throat> sensitive. In Ephesians chapter 5 today, Paul instructs us, as you can see on the screen there, we're to imitate God as what? Little children. Why did he say that? Because if we're going to imitate God, just as a baby's imitating parents, we have to be flexible and pliable in our behavior, don't we? Our hearing has to be very sensitive to God in order to imitate him and to follow him in our life. So I believe Paul is right on target here by emphasizing to us that imitating God requires that we see ourselves as dearly loved little children. Our hearing, our sensitive, our hearing has to be sensitive. Our behavior has to be pliable. Now, in chapter 4 last week, we uh, learned that we are to live a life 
that is worthy, that is in imbalance with the calling of God upon us. We're to put off ungodly behaviors and put on new godly behaviors. Now in chapter 5, Paul continues to drive home this same idea, and this time he states it by saying, imitate God. And I want to share with you there, if you look on your notes, four ideas of how to imitate God. And here's the first one. Look at number one with me. In order to imitate God, number one, we must live a life of love and purity. So those are the first characteristics Paul throws out at us. I want to read verses 1 through 7. So follow along as I read chapter 5, starting in verse 1. He says, Be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For you can be sure, for of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. So the instruction here, very basic, we are to imitate God and this refers, all of these ideas, refer to a very continual habit of life. It's not something we can do one day and forget the next. It's every day we are to be imitating God. And the Greek word here that Paul uses for imitate actually is the same word in English as mimic. So we're mimicking God. We're imitating God. Paul knows that every day we're going to be tempted to imitate something. He knows that we're going to be tempted to sin and to imitate the world in its ungodliness. So he's instructing us to imitate God and do that on a daily basis, just as the little children are imitating their parents. And one way to do this, he says, to live a life of love. Live a life of love and purity. The love that is mentioned here in verse 2 is what the Greeks call agape. It's an agape type of love. It's a sacrificial type of love. It's an unconditional type of love. And the truth behind it here, or even the illustration behind it here, is that Jesus loved us, gave himself up for us as a sacrifice and an offering, a fragrant offering to God. So our motivation to love, to live a life of love, and our example, motivation, is also both are Jesus. The perversion of this type of love, though, is found in these other characteristics he mentions. Sexual immorality, impurity, greed, obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking. Apparently in that day and time, there was a false teaching, even among Christians, that behavior done in the body did not affect the spirit or the soul. And Paul is saying that's incorrect. These kind of behaviors are improper. They do affect your soul and spirit. Therefore, there must not be even a hint, he says, of any of these in our life. These behaviors are out of place. They don't belong in the kingdom of God. And yes, God's wrath will come upon those who continue in these behaviors. So don't be partners. Don't mimic. Don't imitate this type of people. Instead, imitate and mimic God. Be partners with him Live a life of love. And Paul emphasizes to us here that Jesus is our example and our motivation. I chose on the screen here this picture of Valentine M&Ms in order to make you hungry. Is it working? <laughs> They're arranged in the shape of heart. Is it making you hungry by just looking at it? Well, no, that's not the reason I put it up there. Although they do look appetizing, don't they? I put this picture up here to remind you of love, but also to tell you about a story of St. Valentine himself. 
There are many legends about St. Valentine, but here's one. Maybe you've heard this before. In around the 3rd century A.D., the Roman Emperor Claudius II issued a law prohibiting marriage. And the reason Claudius II made that law was because he thought that unmarried soldiers made better soldiers than married soldiers. But the law backfired on him because when he prohibited marriage to have better fighting soldiers, sexual immorality grew rampant <laughs> because nobody could get married. So his law didn't stop anything. Well, Valentine, who was a Roman priest, he ignored the law of Claudius II, and he held secret marriages for Christian couples that wanted to be married. Well, eventually, Valentine was caught, he was arrested, he was tortured for breaking the law. Later, he was asked to renounce his faith in Christ. Of course, this was during a time when Christians were being persecuted. He was an, uh, asked to renounce his faith in Christ. He refused to do so. And so, Valentine was executed on what day? February the 14th, 269 A.D. I will give a, a more discussion about marriage next week as we continue in chapter 5. But today, I want to emphasize to you that if we're going to live a life of love, we have to take this serious. There must not be even a hint of sexual immorality and greed and these other characteristics he lists here. Sadly, in our society today, we have perverted God's love and in a very evil way. Today, people no longer even distinguish between what is sexually moral and what is sexually immoral. It just doesn't matter to them. They don't even distinguish between the two. But here's a truth that will help us. And maybe you've heard this before. Love always gives. Lust always gets. Have you heard that before? Love always gives. Lust always gets. Valentine is our example. He took a stand for Christian marriage. He gave even of his life, believing in Jesus Christ and Christian marriage. He gave. Jesus gave of his life for all people, that all could come to God through faith. Love always gives. Lust always gets. And lust, I will add, is never satisfied. It's never satisfied. So with Jesus as our example, let us live a life of love and of purity. This is how we can imitate God. Now look with me at number two. Here's a second idea on your notes there. In order to imitate God, we must live a life of light, exposing deeds of darkness. So he begins with love, and now he talks about light. Follow along with me as I read verses 8 through 14. Follow the scripture here. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So Paul is continuing now with this idea of imitating God, living a life that is worthy. But this time he uses the word light. Live as children of light. This also, like love, it's a continual day-by-day -day habit, a continual habit of life. Now, you know that both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is often portrayed as light. Not only love, but also light. So if we're going to imitate God, we have to live, as it says, as children of the light. Intellectually, light represents truth. And morally, in our behavior, light represents holiness or righteousness. So Paul says here, the fruit of 
the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and in truth. He's mentioning those characteristics that will show up in our life as we're living as light. So if we want to imitate God, we've got to live a life of light that shows itself in truth and in holiness. Paul reminds us that we all used to be in darkness. For once you were darkness. So the opposite of love is that sexual immorality that he mentioned. The opposite of light then is the darkness, the evil in the world. But we now are light. We are light in Jesus Christ. Our conduct must be in keeping with that light. And just as we are not to have even a hint, he says, of sexual immorality, we're also to have nothing to do, he says, nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Rather than participate in those deeds of darkness, what are we to do? We're to expose them with the light of Jesus that's within us. And then Paul quotes from Isaiah here saying, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises on you. But here's the catch. If I'm out there trying to expose deeds of darkness... But at the same time, I'm hiding my own deeds of darkness. I come across as a hypocrite, right? And what did Jesus say? He said, take the log out of your own eye first, and then you'll be able to see how to get the speck out of someone else's eye. So this is not just a matter of standing up against all darkness. Instead, it's a matter of being God's light, the light of Jesus in the midst of the darkness. One time a lady came to her pastor. She was very disappointed and discouraged about her work environment and the place where she worked. So she sat down with the pastor and she began complaining about her work environment. She said, Pastor, everyone at my workplace is a pagan. And the men especially, they're all the time telling these dirty jokes and flirting with the women. And the women are laughing at the jokes and flirting with the men. It's just terrible. I can't stand it there. So the pastor spoke out and said, well, where do you put a light? She didn't hear what he said. She continued complaining. She said, the only way I can ever get a raise in that place is to flirt with a boss. And I'm not going to flirt with a boss. And again, the pastor interrupted her and said, where do you put a light? And she continued with her complaint saying, every Monday they come in bragging about their parties they've had and what they did and how late they stayed up and how much alcohol they consumed. Pastor, I just can't stand working in their place. What should I do? The third time the pastor said, where do you put a light? This time she had finally paused with her complaints and she heard what he said and repeated the question, where do you put a light? Well, I guess you put a light in a dark place. And as soon as the words came out of her own mouth, she realized the point the pastor was trying to make. We may not like the dark environment we work in. We may not like the dark environment we live in or go to school in. But God has a purpose for us being there. It's to be light in that dark place. And what are we to do there? We're to imitate God. We're to be his light in the world. He says we're not supposed to participate in the darkness. We're not to talk about what is done, he says, in the darkness. Instead, we're to live as light, exposing the deeds of darkness. And I have seen it in my own life, and perhaps you've seen it in yours if we are truly the light of God in our dark world, that eventually that person who's living in darkness will give us the opportunity to share our faith with them. Because light then exposes that deed of darkness. Light brings about confession of sin. The light of Jesus brings about transformation in that person. So be faithful to live as children of light. This is how... We can imitate God. Now look at a third idea with me. Turn your notes over there. Look on the back, number three. In order to imitate God, we must live a life of wisdom. So we've had love, we've had light, and now we have wisdom. Follow along as I read the scripture starting in verse 15. 
be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So Paul is continuing with this idea of how we are to live, how we to imitate God, how we're to, we're to live a life worthy of our calling. And this time he uses the word wisdom. Live a life of wisdom. Again, I emphasize this is a continual habit of life. So love has its opposite of immorality. Light has its opposite of darkness. Wisdom has its opposite of what? It said foolishness, right? Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And we're to do this because the days are short. The days are evil. Therefore, understand what God's will is. Make the most of every opportunity. So how do we gain wisdom? Well, if you think about it, when we study the word of God, we gain knowledge. We gain truth and knowledge. Wisdom is the ability God gives us to make the right use of our knowledge. All that Christian knowledge and truth in our head is not going to make a big, bit of difference until we live it out and obey it. And that's God's wisdom working in us to live out our, his knowledge and his truth. It's the, the way we operate. So I encourage you, pray for wisdom. As you're studying the Word of God, pray for wisdom to live out the truth that is there. I know in my own prayer life, this is one of the things I ask for the most. I ask for God's wisdom because I don't want to be foolish. I want to understand what to do and how to do it and the best way to do it. So I encourage you today, pray for God's wisdom and live your life with His wisdom. And then finally, number four, here's a fourth way to imitate God. Number four says, in order to imitate God, we must live a life filled with God's Spirit. This comes in verses 18 through 21. Follow along as I read 18 through 21. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord always giving thanks to God for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and finally submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Paul continues with one more idea, one more way of imitating God and this time it's the idea of being filled as he says with the Holy Spirit. This also I emphasize is a continual daily habit, a way of life. So love has its opposite of immorality. Light has its opposite of darkness. Wisdom has its opposite of foolishness. What's the opposite of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Don't get drunk on wine. Drunkenness is the opposite. And the point here is that we are to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit controls us just as alcohol would control a junk, drunken person. It's the illustration there he's pointing out. Now this word in the Greek language being filled has several different meanings and the first one is that of total control God wants us to be under his control through the power of his spirit so th that applies here we want the Holy Spirit to be so full in us that we're controlled by him a second meaning for this word of being filled is that the it means to fill out a sail like when you see a sailboat going through the water and that sail has no wrinkles in it because the wind has pushed it all the way out. So in the same way, we want to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that we're guided through life, just the way the wind fills out a sail and guides a sailboat. And the third meaning to this word of being filled has the idea of permeating. Just like salt permeates food and flavors it so we can eat it. So we want the Holy Spirit to be so full in our life, permeating our entire life, that it flavors our life and other people can see that and understand it. But then there's another way of illustrating this idea, and I think it's best with talking about a glove. You know, we have different types of gloves, and they're uh, meant for different uses to help us. But a glove without a hand in it is really useless. 
once we put our hand in the glove, then the glove becomes useful. So our hand fills the glove, and then the glove is very helpful and beneficial to us. The Holy Spirit fills us and makes us useful. But without the filling of the Holy Spirit, we're just kind of like a glove, you know? We can't really do anything. But with the Holy Spirit, we can. A glove needs a hand, and you and I, we need the Holy Spirit. How do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? I think it's simply dying to self and allowing God to control us. A daily habit of life of dying to self and allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us up. If we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us, if we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to control us, then we're going to allow something else to control us. An example here in the scripture was getting drunk on wine. You know, we're going to look for something else to control our life unless we give it to the Holy Spirit. And I like here that Paul states some results of being filled with the Spirit. He says there's singing, there's the giving thanks, uh, giving thanks to God for everything in the name of Jesus, and finally there is the submission idea, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. But when I look around at churches and denominations, most of the time, rather than seeing unity, rather than seeing this filling of the Holy Spirit, I instead see fighting and conflict. I don't see submissiveness to each other or reverence for Christ. Instead, I see fighting about songs. <laughs> A lot of Christians are fighting about what songs to sing. But the scripture here is very clear. We're to sing psalms. We're to sing hymns, and we are to sing spiritual songs. The psalms, of course, for them would have been the Old Testament psalms that David wrote. They would sing those in praise to God. The hymns would have been their songs about faith in Christ as new Christians living in that New Testament church. And their spiritual songs would have been the spontaneous songs of their heart that they sang to God. So rather than arguing about what to sing, we're to sing all types of songs. It's right there in chapter 5. So I encourage you, be filled with the God Spirit. This is how we can imitate God. And the results, the singing, the thanksgiving, and the submission to one another out of reverence for Christ, all of this leading to unity. So we come to the seventh key to unity for today. Remember, after each sermon, as we go through Ephesians, we're learning different keys to unity. So today it is this. Imitate God as his dearly loved child. Paul has given to us several ideas of what that can mean, and I hope some of these are meaningful to you that will help you to imitate God. When my wife and I first got married, uh, most of her grandparents were still alive, and her grandfather, Phillips, uh, Jesse Phillips lived there in Birmingham, and when we were in Birmingham, we often visited Mr. Phillips. And he had a yellow parakeet named Woodstock. You know, Snoopy, ha uh, Charlie Brown had a pet, Snoopy. Snoopy had a pet named Woodstock, the little yellow bird. And every time we would go, Jesse, her grandfather, would try to show off how, what this bird could do. And he had taught the bird to say, the parakeet, to say, Where's Snoopy? Where's Snoopy? So every time we're there, he would get the bird and try to get the bird to say, Where's Snoopy? I don't remember that bird ever talking. <laughs> he said the bird would talk, but the bird never talked when we were there. I think the bird was too stubborn to imitate anybody. I never did hear that bird talk. But I looked forward to hearing it talk. It just didn't talk. When it comes to imitating God, we too are often stubborn, aren't we? We have our own ways. We have our sinful ideas. And we hesitate often to imitate God. But you know what? God has provided us with his love. He has provided us with his light. He has provided us with his wisdom. He has provided us with his Holy Spirit. Why? So we can imitate him. 
We are without excuse. He's given us everything we need to live a life worthy of the calling, to imitate him. My invitation to you today is this. Be willing to imitate God as his dearly loved child. Let's pray about it. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much for giving to us your unconditional love, your holiness of light, your godly wisdom, and your precious Holy Spirit. Thank you for blessing us with these resources that we may imitate you. Thank you most of all for adopting us as your children, your dearly loved children through our faith in Jesus Christ. And today, as your child, we choose to imitate you. Forgive us where we've sinned. Forgive us where we've messed up and we've been stubborn and done our own thing. For you are our perfect Father in heaven. Help us to accomplish your will by imitating you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.